Oh, Father, we sing hallelujah to you today. Uh, we do see, we do understand who you are. We recognize your good hand in all of the earth. We recognize your sovereignty, your brilliance, your majesty. We know that an age is coming when you will send your son to rule on this earth. And we long for that day. We long for the day where we can praise you with new bodies, with new minds, free from the effects of sin. Father, we long for that day. Lord, I pray that you would be exalted, you would be honored in this time. I pray that your son would be seen for who he really is, your people for who they are. Lord, I pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. All right. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to Revelation 20 this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6. We're going to be looking at the end and the beginning. And I picked this title because our passage this morning's looks at the end of this age and the beginning of the next age. It looks at how the end of this age occurs and how the next age begins. And God wants us to know these things. He cares very much that we know these things. So he revealed these things to us in his infallible word. God wants us to know that this age will not last forever. It will come to an end. And he wants us to know how this age will come to an end that he will use both the powers of good and evil to bring this age to an end. And God wants us to know what will come next. What will come next is an age of holy, righteous rule. God also wants us to know these things because these things have implications on how we live our lives today. How we view our time, our energy, our resources, and most importantly, our stewardship of the gospel given what we know about the age that is to come. But before we parachute into Revelation chapter 20, it's good to have a basic outline of the letter so we can appreciate what is so significant and so substantial about the end and the beginning. So John writes Revelation as a letter from Jesus to the seven churches. And uh, his purpose is to declare to them that Jesus truly is the Messiah. And as Messiah, he will reign forever. He will reign in his millennial kingdom first, and then he will reign alongside the Father in the eternal kingdom. And our passage today focuses on the first of those two kingdoms, the millennial kingdom, a kingdom that exists not in the new heaven and the new earth, but here on this earth. And it will last for a period of a thousand years, and Jesus is reigning here. And in his kindness, God shows us not only how this kingdom begins, but he also explains to us the events that will unfold this age here. The letter starts with John describing an encounter that he has with Jesus, in which he sees Jesus in the full extent of his glory and his majesty. He is so impressive and he is so fearsome that John falls down like a dead man. And this encounter gives us the assurance that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. And that the events which transpire at the end of this age, as sobering as they are, are all part of God's design to establish Jesus as the one who will rule over this earth. And John dictates letters to seven churches, the seven churches in Asia Minor, and Eric read one of those to us today, the church in Thyatira. These letters contain instructions and comforts and warnings to these churches. And they're a picture of the condition of the church in this age, this age where we are today. And it's good for us to know this because knowing this helps us understand how profoundly different the next age will be. The churches that John describes are the churches that we see today. They're loveless churches. They're persecuted churches. They're compromising churches. They're corrupt churches. They're dead churches, faithful churches, and lukewarm churches. And then in chapter four, John describes the throne room of heaven in which we see God in all of his holiness. And seeing God in his character this way is really important because it helps us understand why this age, with all of its corruption and all of its rebellion against God, must come to an end. And then John brings Jesus back into view in chapter 5, and he makes it very clear that Jesus is the lamb who purchased the saints with his own blood. He alone is qualified because of that purchase to preside over the events that transpire at the end of this age. 
and it is him who will give the saints rule on this earth. Then chapters 6 and 19 describe those events that transpire at the end of this age. There's a seven-year period of time known as the Great Tribulation, three and a half years of a false peace, followed by three and a half years of Jacob's trouble, a time in which the Antichrist asserts himself and he brings about unspeakable atrocities and persecution against Jewish people. And John tells us that during that time, well, God will begin to pour out his wrath on this world. There will be a series of judgments, seven seal judgments, and then seven trumpet judgments, and seven bowl judgments. And by the end of it, Babylon, that worldwide system of economic depravity and religion that was so pervasive will be destroyed. And in chapter 19, John describes how Jesus brings this world to an end. The Antichrist and the great armies of this world are arrayed against helpless Israel at Armageddon. And Jesus exits heaven in all of his power, in all of his majesty, all of his brilliance, and he rescues them. And he does it first by hurling the Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire. He doesn't even allow them to lead their army in battle against uh, Israel. Then the army itself that was arrayed against the Jews, they had lost their leader before the battle even started. And then Jesus kills the rest of the army. He kills every single one of them. He kills the kings. He kills the commanders. He kills mighty men, horses, and those who sit on those horses. And then he kills the common soldier. He kills every single one that is arrayed against his people. And he does it with a sword that emits from his mouth. And John doesn't describe the battle, but the Old Testament does. One place is in Zechariah 14. And in that battle, Jesus is so dominant. He is so dominant over those that are opposed to him that he causes their flesh and their eyes to rot in their sockets. There's nothing they can do about it. He's so dominant over them that not only do their bodies fail, but their powers of reason fail them. Christ will take that away too. And Zechariah explains that a great panic from the Lord fell upon those in the army. And they began to raise their hands against one another. The very thing that sinful man uses to oppose God God uses to accomplish his own ends. The hand of one man was lifted against the other. They were fighting against themselves. The battle that the Antichrist promised would be the end of the Jews turned out to be what brought about the end of the Antichrist. And it was all because of Jesus, the Messiah. And what this victory at Armageddon did was it removed all of sinful rule from this earth. Every single form of sinful rule that was on this earth was eliminated. And that was what set the stage for the next age to begin. And that's why we find ourselves at the beginning of chapter 20. So with that as a backdrop, let's uh, take a look at our passage and we read it. Let's read it together and look at two things that happen. First in the verses one through three, look at what happens to Satan. And then as I read verses four through six, look at the authority structure that is installed in place. John writes, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. And threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones and they sat on them. And judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. John describes the defeat of the Antichrist and the false prophet at the end of chapter 19. So the natural question is, what happens to Satan? The one who is the source of the power behind those two, the Antichrist and the false prophet. The one whose ultimate desire is to exalt himself at the ruler of the universe. And John picks up in chapter 20, right where he left off at the end of chapter 19. And what we see is that Christ will inaugurate his millennial kingdom with two 
inevitable events. And the first of these is the removal of Satan. And that's in verses 1 and 3 through 3. So John starts verse 1, and he says, Then I saw. What John is doing here is he is continuing a pattern that he began back in verse 11 in chapter 19. In verse 11, John says, And I saw heaven opened. And then in verse 17, he says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. In verse 19, he says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth. And here he says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. He says, and I saw, then I saw, and I saw, then I saw. John is describing a sequence of events. The events of our passage in chapter 20 followed directly and immediately after the events in chapter 19. Jesus has just defeated the Antichrist at the Battle of Armageddon, and this is what comes next. And what we see that comes next is the removal of Satan is accomplished by two things. And first, it's accomplished by divine authority. What John saw was an angel coming down from heaven. And this is the first indication of the divine authority that runs throughout this whole passage. The angel is coming down from heaven, and this is an unfallen angel, one that has remained faithful to God since the beginning of human history. Scripture gives us good clarity as to what the role and the function of these angels are. The author of Hebrews writes for us in chapter 1, verse 14, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? This angel is not acting on his own volition. Angels are ministering spirits that are sent out to render service. And their service is unto God. And because their service is unto God, their service carries the authority of God. God's authority is what is on display here. This angel is is not on his own mission. He's on a mission that is from God. He is obeying God. He is clearly under God's instruction and guidance. So we see God's authority on display in the angel's service. And then we see God's authority in the resources that the angel has at his disposal. And the first of these is what he's holding in his hand. The angel was holding the key of the abyss in his hand. We need to spend a little time on this because a right understanding of the abyss underscores the comprehensive nature of God's authority. The word abyss in Greek literally means bottomless, an infinitely deep hole, something with no lower bound. And in scripture, the use of an abyss speaks to a place of confinement. In our context, it's a place of confinement for fallen angels. Fallen angels in the abyss are confined so that they cannot carry out any service to their master, Satan. Some demons have been the abyss since the beginning. Listen to the words of 2 Peter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, then Peter goes on. Peter's describing a banishment that took place when Satan rebelled against God. Some of those fallen angels who rebelled with Satan didn't even get to serve him. Instead, Peter tells us they were cast by God into the abyss, and they are still there today. Other fallen angels are not in the abyss today. Think of the encounter between Jesus and the man who was possessed by a demon, many demons, in Luke chapter 8. Luke's account sheds good light on the idea of this abyss. Jesus says to the man, what is your name? And the man responds, legion. For many demons had entered him, and they were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. These demons are actively working. They had possession of this man, so they were working today in that time. They were doing the work of Satan, their master, and they did not want to be sent into the abyss because they knew that in the abyss they would not be able to perform service to their master. In just a bit, we're going to begin talking about the Antichrist, or the beast. The beast is presently in the abyss. When John writes of the two witnesses in chapter 11, Revelation chapter 11, he describes how the Antichrist comes out of the abyss. John writes this in verse 11. Sorry, verse 7, Revelation 11, 7. When they, the two witnesses, have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them, and it will overcome them, 
and kill them. The Antichrist has been in the abyss. He's been in the abyss since the beginning. And the angel in our passage has the key to the abyss. Sometimes when we think of a key, we think of having access to something. You know, we like the key to our car. We take our key, we open our car, we get in and we drive away. Other uses of the word have less to do with access and more to do with confinement. And that's the idea here. If you have the key, you have the authority to keep something confined. And that's exactly what's in view here. That's what the angel has. He has authority from God to keep this um, Satan confined. The angel has been given possession of the key by God, and that possession points to the authority that is from God. But the angel doesn't have just a key in his hand. He also has a great chain in his hand. Take a look at that. That will help us understand the authority that God has in this process. We know that a chain is used to bind, and we know that larger chains are used for larger tasks. But notice the modifier, great. John has really good reason for this modifier. Let's take a look at the testimony of Scripture that gives us some sense of Satan's power relative to man's power. Job chapter 2. Satan is before the Lord, he's in the presence of the Lord, and he is seeking permission to afflict Job. Verse 7 of chapter 2 says that, Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. There was nothing that Job could do about this. He couldn't resist, he couldn't avoid, he couldn't evade Satan. Any power that Satan has clearly is given to him by the one who created him. But that power is great. That power is very impressive. It's great enough to smite Job and put boils all over his body. If we go back to our story of the demon-possessed man in Luke chapter 8, we can see some more of evidence of how powerful Satan really is. Listen to the words that describe the condition of the man as Jesus was casting the demons out of him. In verse 29 of Luke 8, Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times. And he was bound with chains and shackles, and he kept under guard. And yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. These chains were no obstacle for Satan's demons. They would be no obstacle for Satan himself. Satan himself possesses power that's beyond what we see and know in this world, beyond what we're familiar with. And this is why the angel has a great chain in his hand. This is no human chain. It's not limited by human elements or human dimensions. Instead, it's a chain with supernatural size and supernatural composition. It must be robust, and it is robust enough to contain and constrain Satan from his activity. So it's good for us to stop and see what God is saying to Satan at this point. He is saying, you have sought to kill my people Israel. You have sought to kill my son, the Messiah. You have sought to exterminate the saints in the tribulation age. And you have been functioning at this point only because I have allowed you to be. I have always been an authority over you, and the key of the abyss and the great chain are symbols of that authority. So Satan's removal is accomplished first by divine authority and second by divine activity. And we see that in verses 2 and 3. We're going to see the activity of the angel here in several stages. And each one underscores the authority that God has over Satan. First, the angel laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. This is the first time Satan is mentioned by that name since chapter 12. You have to go back eight chapters to find Satan referred to with this name. And in chapter 12, Satan is persecuting Israel at the beginning of the tribulation. But notice that John refers to Satan with two names, and these are very important descriptors, and we need to understand them because they help us see Satan's true nature. First, he refers to Satan as the dragon. This highlights Satan's destructive nature. 1 Peter 5 tells us in verse 8 that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Satan is a beast. And true to that nature, he seeks to devour. 
John also refers to Satan as the serpent. He does that to remind us of Satan's deceptive power and deceptive nature. The deceit that's been at work since the beginning of time with Adam and Eve. Remember what Genesis 3 says about Satan. It says, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So what we have is in Satan is a destructive, deceptive beast. It doesn't get much more dangerous than that. That seems to elicit fear in just about anybody, but not here in this context. John tells us that the angel laid hold of the dragon. And the idea here is a physical grasp, a grasp that brings an opponent into submission under your power. And that's what's taking place. The angel places such a hold on Satan that Satan can do nothing but yield to him. The angel proves that God endowed him with greater power than he gave to Satan. This is divine activity through the agency of the angel. Then John goes on to tell us that the angel bound Satan after forcing Satan into submission. The angel restricts him by fastening him with that great chain that he had in his hand. This renders Satan unable to function, unable to operate, unable to do what he's been doing since the beginning. That is deceiving mankind. And John tells us that Satan is kept in this condition. He is bound for a thousand years, literally 1,000 years. And the phrase a thousand years or the thousand years appears five times in our passage. And it appears again in verse seven. And we need to see this as a specific period of time that begins in the future and it lasts for a thousand years. And it's important that we get this right because we need to see this as an event which occurs in a completely different world order than what we have today. And the reason for that is that the removal of Satan from this world is an essential step to bring about the millennial kingdom that is free of the effects of sin. So to see this, what we're going to do is we're going to follow a progression of events from verse 11 in chapter 19 all the way through to verse 1 in chapter 21. So I mentioned it briefly before. John says, I saw, or then I saw, a total of eight times in that span of verses. Three of them come before our passage, three of them are after our passage, and two of them are in our passage. I mentioned verse 11 of chapter 19. John says, and I saw a heaven opened. And then again in verse 17, then I saw an angel standing in the sun. In verse 19, and I saw the beast. This is a progression. This is a progression left to right in time. Jesus ascends down to Armageddon. He leaves heaven, ascends to Armageddon in verse 19. In verse 17, you have the angel that is declaring the victory that Jesus will have at Armageddon. And then in verses 19 and 20, you have Jesus accomplishing that victory. These are all future events. They have not yet happened. And John indicates all of them with, and I saw, or then I saw. In our passage, John uses the exact same wording. He says, then I saw an angel, immediately following the defeat of the Antichrist. Then I saw an angel. And in verse 4, he says, then I saw thrones, saints who would rule with Christ. These are two more points in the same progression moving left to right in time. Jesus' victory at Armageddon is followed by the binding of Satan, which is followed by the thrones. Again, these are future events. John uses the same then wording that he was using before. This helps us understand that all of these events are happening left to right in time, and they're all in the future. And then after our passage, John continues with the same language. In verse 11, he says, then I saw a great white throne. In verse 12, he says, then I saw the dead. And in verse 1 of chapter 21, John writes, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. These events are farther along in the same progression. The end of the millennial age is covered in verses 7 through 10. And after that, you have Jesus sitting on the great white throne. That's followed by the judgment of the dead that are standing before the great white throne. And then that's followed by the new heaven and the new earth. So again, John is describing a sequence of events, and all of them are in the future. The binding of Satan, which lasts for a thousand years, is in the middle of those events. It's important for us to see that. We don't want to belabor the point 
but we want to see that what we're talking about is a future period of time that is free from the influence of Satan. And if we get that right, we can appreciate the scope of what God is doing here. God is doing something extremely significant here. He is changing all of world order. And so after Jesus binds Satan with the chain, John tells us that he throws the devil into the abyss. We think back to Satan in verse 1. He's now put into the place of confinement with all of the other fallen angels who have been there since the beginning of time. He's confined, which means he cannot devour, he cannot deceive, and he cannot do what he naturally does by nature. Notice, too, and think about the humiliation that Satan must be experiencing here. Remember that when Satan chose to rebel against God, a number of angels followed him. They followed after him. And in his divine wisdom, God chose that some of them would be cast immediately into the abyss. They were cast into hell and committed them to pits of darkness. They were never given the opportunity to serve Satan, never given the opportunity to serve their master. Instead, they were put straight into the abyss. And this is the first occasion in which they set their eyes upon their master. And what do they see? Do they see their master coming to release them and free them from their own imprisonment? No. They see their master bound with the great chain and he's incarcerated together with them. Again, this is divine activity through the agency of the angel. And then John tells us that the angel shut the abyss and he sealed it over him. Not only is Satan bound and then thrown into the abyss, but the door is closed and it is closed decisively. This underscores the fact that the point of exit for Satan has been cut off. It's not available to him. To the one whose very nature is to deceive and murder, he's been restricted from the only realm in which he can do that. So he doesn't have the opportunity to operate the way he always has. And then the angel, not only did he shut the abyss, but he sealed it over him. His sealing conveys the idea that not only has access been removed, but Satan's ability to regain that access has been removed. And soon we'll see why that's important, but his access to the world to influence it for his destructive purposes has been decisively taken away. And it won't be restored by his own doing. And we need to understand that. We need to understand that God's good purpose in all of this is seen at the end of verse 3, so that he will not deceive the nations any longer. We're clearly looking at a different age in human history here. Our present age is beset with the influence of Satan, and it has been that way since the beginning in the fall in Genesis chapter 3. And we see it all over in our culture. We see his influence everywhere. But our best counsel that tells us that Satan is at work and that he is influencing the world comes from Scripture itself. I want us to consider two New Testament passages that are good for us to have in front of us at this time. The first is in 2 Corinthians 4. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he says, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, in verse 4. He's blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. That's what the enemy does. He's at work today blinding. If a person doesn't believe, it's because the enemy has blinded them and made it impossible for them to see Christ for who he truly is. Paul's writing his second letter to Timothy. Chapter 2, verse 26, he's describing those who are opposed to the gospel and his desire for those people. And Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 26, his desire is that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. They've been held captive by him to do his will. So not only does Satan blind the individual from seeing the gospel, but he holds them captive to do his will. He's actively at work in them. So in all of the events, the laying hold of Satan, the binding of Satan, the throwing him into the abyss, the shutting of the abyss, and the sealing of the abyss, John's language is very dramatic. It's very forceful. And the reason why he uses such dramatic and forceful language is that we'll also understand the scope of the change that the world will experience when Satan is removed from it. We need to understand exactly what will happen. What will take place is something that is very, very substantial when Satan is removed. And nowhere do we see this more important than who's in charge when Satan is removed. 
And we'll see that. And who's in charge is the reign of the saints. And John talks about that in verses 4, 5, and 6. So the second significant event that inaugurates and brings about the millennial age is the reign of the saints. If we look at the beginning of verse 4, we see that John is describing two kinds of people, two groups of people, I should say. And the first he simply refers to with the word they. He says, and I saw thrones and they sat on them. We have to ask ourselves who they is. The second group is those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. Two different groups of saints will rule together with Jesus, and they are the resurrected saints and the tribulation saints. So John saw thrones and they sat on them. So let's consider that first group. Who is it that he says they about? Well, the clearest way to see that is to start with the word they and to work backwards to our left in our text and see who this could possibly be referring to. Working backwards, we notice that they is plural, so it can't refer to Satan because that's an individual. And it can't refer to the angel who bound him because that's also an individual. It's not the beast and the false prophet in chapter 19, verse 20, because they're in the lake of fire. And it's not the army of the beast because they were killed at Armageddon. And it's not the angel standing in the sun in verse 7, 17. Again, that's singular. So it can't be any of those. We have to go all the way back to verse 14 to see who John is referring to. Revelation 19, 14. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine white linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. This refers to the church sage saints, the saints of the church age that followed Jesus out of heaven down to Armageddon. They're clothed in white linen. This is corroborated by the rest of our New Testament. When Paul writes to the church in Corinth in chapter 6 of his first letter in Scripture to them, he writes, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? The saints in this passage refers to Christians throughout the church age. They will judge the world. So John sees the church age saints sitting on the throne and judgment was given to them. It's from those thrones that they will judge the world. As saints possessing re resurrection bodies, which are beyond the reach of sin and beyond the reach of death, they will rule over the earth. But this group is not limited to the saints of the church age. Jesus extended a specific promise to his disciples. He's teaching them about the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 19. And in verse 28, he explains exactly who they will be and what they will be in the, the next age. Peter says to him, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? In Matthew 19, 28, Jesus says to them, truly I tell you that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So included in that group of people who are sitting on thrones is a set of thrones that are specifically allocated for the apostles, and they could be judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But there's a third group of people that's included in this first set in the John sees. To identify these people, we need to go back to the Old Testament. Daniel 7, which we've looked at recently on Sunday night, helps us understand this. It speaks of the time of Jacob's trouble. This is the second half, the three and a half years at the end of the tribulation, a period when the Antichrist opposes the Jews and it describes the rescue of his people by Jesus like this. This is Daniel chapter 7, verses 26 and 27. But the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. So that's the removal of the Antichrist. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and the dominions will serve and obey him. So the sovereignty of the kingdoms under the heaven refers to the rule over the nations, and that rule will be given to the people who are the saints of the highest one. And in Daniel's context, that included Old Testament saints who were faithful to God. Those people were not part of the rapture of the church, but they were faithful to God. 
and they're present at the beginning of verse 4. Another passage in the Old Testament describes the same experience, only with a focus on the Jews. So if you have your Bible with you, turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. We're going to look at verses 12 through 14 together. This passage is good because it describes this same event from the perspective of the Jews and what God tells the Jews. And as we read this, notice how many times God says to Israel, my people. Ezekiel 37, 12 through 14. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. So what Yahweh himself says to the people of Israel is, you are my people and I will put my spirit in you and you will come to life and I will place you on your land. So John is describing three subgroups of people in this first group. He's describing the church, he's describing the apostles, he's describing Old Testament saints. And they're sitting on thrones and they're judging the operations of the world. And because their rule is together with Christ, and because their rule is subordinate to Christ, their rule will be characterized by the same character of Christ. And there are two elements of Christ's character that are put on display as they rule, and those are truth and righteousness. Let's think about what this means for a minute. The millennial kingdom will be populated with believers and unbelievers alike. And these thrones represent positions of authority throughout the world in the next age. So what this tells us is that every national, every regional, every local governmental role will be carried out by a resurrected saint. A person whose body is beyond the reach of sin and death. And the same will be true for every position of authority outside of the government, in business and in agriculture, in the financial world and in the legal world. Every single one of those offices will be held by a person who has a singular sinless devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. And because Jesus rules with righteousness and truth, so they too will rule with the same righteousness and truth. Zechariah says this in chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. I invite you to turn there as well. To get to Zechariah, go to Matthew's Gospel, then turn left past Malachi and to Zechariah. You'll get there. Zechariah chapter 8, 7 and 8. What Zechariah is going to do here is he is going to explain to the people of Israel what the context in Israel will be when he returns them, when God returns them to their land. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Behold, I am going to save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west, and I will bring them back. And they will live in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Every single business transaction, every single law, every single judicious decision, everything will be done in accordance with truth and righteousness. There won't be any laws, there won't be any decisions that are in defiance of the plain and simple truth of who we are as men and women before God. So that characterizes the millennial rule. It's one in which there is going to be righteousness and truth. But there's one other element that will be there. And it'll be on display, and that is peace. And that is because that is part of Christ's character, the part of who Christ is and what he does. We see that in the New Testament in Romans 5.1 tells us that we have been justified by faith and having been justified by that faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the result of Christ's work at the cross is a new peace between the believer and God. And if Christ's work brings peace between a new believer and God, then the rule of Christ in the millennial kingdom will be characterized by that same peace. It will be true both in Israel and throughout the world. We'll stay right there in Zechariah 8, and this is God's promise to Israel. This is very, very comforting to the people of Israel. But now I know I will not treat the remnant of this people as in former days. This is verses 11 and 12. I will not treat the remnant of this people as in former days, declares the Lord of hosts. There will be peace for the seed 
The vine will yield its fruit. The land will yield its produce and the heavens will give their due. And I will cause the remnant of these people to inherit all of these things. So God has a place for Israel to return. It is their own land. It's going to be characterized by righteousness and truth. It will also be characterized by peace. But God makes the same promise for the rest of the world. He does that in Micah chapter 4. Let me just read Micah 4, verses 3 and 4 for you. As I read this, listen to what is being said about the nation of the world, the nations of the world, and all of the peace that they have. And he will judge between many nations and render decisions for mighty distant nations. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not lift up sword against another and never again will they train for war. Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid. The implements of war, the swords, the spears, the shields, everything else, they're going to be refactored into farming tools. There's no need for military equipment because there's permanent worldwide peace. That's encouraging. So John identifies two different groups of people, categories of saints together with Jesus. The first are the resurrected ones, the ones who are raised from the dead and are present. And then we see a second group of people as we read the rest of verse 4. And these are the tribulation saints. John writes, And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony, the testimony of Jesus because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. John's describing a group of people who have all been martyred for their faith. They lost their lives for their faith. And John gives us three reasons why they've been martyred. First, because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. These were people who were unwavering in their proclamation of Christ. They made a testimony of Christ and what he'd done. And we see the context in which they did this in the rest of the verse. They lived in a period of time when the peace was, the, the Antichrist was front and center. They proclaimed Christ and they were faithful to the word of God. And they weren't afraid of those who were put in positions of authority. They spoke the truth. They were faithful to God's calls on their life. And they were clearly out of step with everybody else in their culture. And they lost their life because of it. The second reason why they were martyred because they had not worshipped the beast or his image. Back in Revelation chapter 13, we read that the false prophet comes into view and he deceives the world. And there's an idol that is made, an image of the beast. And the, the false prophet caused this. He caused the, the image of the beast to speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. The tribulation saints were worshipers of Christ. They loved Christ. They knew who Christ was. They understood him to be their savior. They would not worship an image of the Antichrist. And it cost them their life. And the last reason, briefly, was that they had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. The false prophet caused all the people in the world who were part of the world system to take a mark on their hand or on their forehead. And the stipulation was that if you didn't have that mark, you could not buy or sell. You wouldn't have access to the bare necessities of food and shelter and basic services. But these saints wouldn't take that mark. They wouldn't take the mark because their allegiance was to Christ and not to the beast. And again, it cost them their life. Well, this group of people came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. They have the same role. They have the same function as those that John described at the beginning of the verse. This group is mentioned back in chapter 6 of Revelation. This is in the first series of judgments. And this is in the seal judgments. It's the fifth of the seven seal judgments. And some of the saints have been martyred by that time. And John records what they say when they are under the altar. They cry out to Jesus and they say, How long will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth. They knew that their, their deaths were unjust. They understood that there was no good reason for their death. And they were eager to see their deaths avenged. Think about their joy now in this situation. They were martyred for their faith and they were waiting for Christ to avenge their death. How sweet will it be to see their, 
their immediate experience. Their immediate experience is that they're sitting on thrones and they're ruling and they're reigning with Christ. They had lost their lives at the hands of those who persecuted them. And their next experience in a physical body is that they are ruling on the earth with Christ. Everything is safe. Everything is fruitful. Everything is productive. Everything is peaceful. And it will remain that way for a thousand years. And all of it is ultimately under the wise oversight of Messiah Jesus, the one for whom they suffered. That's encouraging for them. There's one other aspect of the saint's reign that's worth remembering and worth looking at. And and we see that in verses 5 and 6, and that is their security. But John starts that by talking about the rest of the dead. By this time, all the saints, whether they're Old Testament saints or New Testament saints or church age saints or tribulation saints, they've all been resurrected. They all have new bodies that are impervious to death and they're ruling and they're reigning with Christ. And John talks about the rest. This refers to everybody who died in unbelief in human history. Everybody who died in the Old Testament in unbelief. Everybody who died in the New Testament in unbelief and the church age and the tribulation age. They did not come to life with everybody else. They remained dead. At death, their bodies and their souls were separated. Their bodies remained in the grave or in the sea, but their souls are in conscious agony and torment in Hades. And they stay in that place, John writes there, until the thousand years are completed. And what awaits them is the great white throne judgment that is followed by the second death. The single most sobering paragraph in all of scripture, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. It's the final condemnation of all unbelievers to an eternal lake of fire. But John returns to the saints after looking at the outcome for those unbelievers. And he describes the saints as having participated in the first resurrection. They have resurrected bodies. And because they have resurrected bodies, the second death, the lake of fire, has no power over them. That's encouraging to them. That's securing for them. Their sin has been forgiven by Christ's work on their behalf at the cross, and they have been released from the penalty of their sin. So what we have here is Scripture's testimony that placing your trust in Christ causes you to be resurrected prior to the second death, and it has no power over you. These people will be priests of God and of Christ. This is their their function. This is their process. This is what they do in the millennial age. They're priests of God and of Christ. And a priest is one who is characterized by service. They'll be in continual, continual service to God, who chose them before the foundations of the world, and continual service to Christ, who purchased them with his own blood. And all of this, again, will take place on the earth for a thousand years. And that is encouraging. So there's a couple implications of us for the believer today. I want us to take a look at a few of them. Uh, First is that this passage gives us confidence in the gospel message itself. It gives us confidence in the gospel message. Do you ever find yourself in a moment of doubt, wondering if the gospel is really the only message that saves? Does anybody else ever get to heaven without believing in Christ? Well, this passage helps you understand that. Meditate on the truths of this passage and be encouraged by that, that there is one gospel message that is powerful and is effective, and you can be confident that it will save you. Another implication for us today is that this passage should diminish our pride. Think about who you were when God saved you. Think about the judgment that you deserved. Think about that lake of fire that you deserve. And think about sitting on a throne and all that entails. And ask yourself, would God really prepare that for me? That chases away pride. So when you feel pride and arrogance welling up inside of you, just think of the role that God has for you in the future, despite the condition you were in when he saved you. Thirdly, this passage should inform how you invest yourself in this world. What is your aim for allocating your time, your energy, your resources? If you have a clear conscience in that area, praise God. Praise God. 
keep doing the same thing, excel still more. But if you have not calibrated your aim and your purpose in this life with the truth of scripture and the knowledge of what is taking place in the rest of eternity, in the next age, the one that is to come, perhaps you should. Spend some time thinking about what this passage is telling us is our end as believers. This passage should also inform your prayer life. Is thanksgiving, is worship lacking in your prayer life? When you sit down to pray, is it hard for you to think about things to to worship God for, to thank God for? Spend some time in this passage. And again, consider the place that you will have as a child of God sitting on a throne, ruling in this world for a thousand years. And the reasons to praise God and thank God will be many. And lastly, this passage should inform your heart to share the gospel. Do you regularly think about what is waiting for your friends who are lost, your relatives who are lost, your neighbors and your coworkers? It's awkward to share the gospel message with them. Sometimes it's very uncomfortable. Sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes it's, it's very humbling. But when you think about what is coming in the next age, it puts all of that in the proper perspective. Let's pray. Father, I praise you that you have been clear with us, been clear with us about your program for human history, that you have us here in this age by your grace. You saved us by your grace. You sustain us by your grace. You cause us to function by your grace in this age. And you're pleased, Lord, to use the gospel message to save us. You're pleased to give us the privilege of sharing that gospel message that will save others. But then, Lord, you have taken this gospel message and you have used it and you have told us what will take place in the next age. And I pray for us. I pray that we would be people who are motivated by what you will do for us in the next age. That we'll be earnest to serve you in this age so we would be ready for you in the next age. Oh God, I pray for Grace Bible Church, that you grant us the grace we need to be obedient and faithful to you. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.